If you can show that a witness is lying or can't be trusted on one thing, members of the jury are far less likely to believe them on most of the rest of their testimony. That is true. And that is exactly why you don't want to lie about anything in a court hearing. And you need to prepare to be telling the truth about whatever it is. You do not do that. The whole jury is going to be watching and his own expert confirming the yes, other expert with the body language. You do not do that. You do not dare do that. So this is going to be real lawyer reacts to real lawyer reacting <laughs> to <laughs> my cousin Vinny. And so do you like this movie? Oh, I love this movie. I love this movie too. It's like one of my favorites. And I actually think it's very accurate, but we're going to find out right now. Well, wait, don't they use this in law school? Sometimes. Because Daniel told me. Oh, it's me. discussed a lot. Yeah. So Daniel and I were in different sections. My section yeah. didn't do it uh, so much. I'm sure it came up. I don't particularly remember it, but I know it was talked about in yeah. other sections more than mine. Because Daniel says it's probably the most accurate movie when it comes to It's pretty accurate. Legal. Yeah. Except that. Actually, so there's one part where he goes, it's called disclosure. How do you get it through law school without knowing that? You can actually get through law school and the bar exam without knowing that. Because hmm. law schools don't particularly teach you things that are necessarily going to be used in your career or in the bar exam. Right. There are some schools that teach bar classes and teach to the bar. Mm -hmm. They teach you so that you can pass the bar exam, which seems like the point to me in a large extent. But a lot of law schools don't teach that. I don't know what the point of a lot of law I schools are. I would think are. you would want to teach both. <laughs> you do want to teach both. Yeah. And um, I could see how he could get through law school without knowing that. Right. I'm holding you in contempt of court. It is a f***ing surprise. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> what? What'd you just say? Don't talk back to the judge. Quit while you're ahead. Yes. Or quit while you're slightly behind. And, and I don't even think he realized that he, that judge was hearing him, but you should. Right. The judge can hear everything. Everybody can hear well, everything. Well, this is his first time in the courtroom. I know. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's not conscious of the, all of the behaviors that and you have to do. And don't use that kind of language. <laughs> not in court. Not in court. But, I mean, you... You know, it's interesting because we have a lot of witnesses that are saying what they said and they're just saying right. it. And some witness, I had a witness in a deposition this week that said the B word. And we we're like, what's the B word? And she goes, B I T, you know. Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, I we need you like, to actually say the word. <laughs> we, yeah, well, we were like, oh, I, we thought it was something else because that's, you know, and because she had just said that accusing i think she had accused our client or somebody uh, you know of saying the f word th that one mm -hmm. that you're thinking of and mm -hmm. she just said it out but the b word no that one's <laughs> <laughs> she, that one got spelled that's the one that's the line <laughs> movie is so great hey legal eagles it's time to think like a lawyer Oh, I hate it every time he says that because I've been trying not to think like a lawyer ever since I got out of law school. <laughs> All right. Animated. Smile more. Today we are covering My Cousin Vinny, one of my favorite legal movies of all time. And mine too, because it's surprisingly accurate. Yes. It's very, very accurate, except the trial happens way too quick for a murder trial. Oh, yeah. I was like, man, they get through that in like a week. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, 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 not the length of the trial, the length of the, yeah, the length of the trial for a jury trial, a, a lot of times you're going to be in that. It's, it depends on if they're seeking the death penalty or not. Right. Death penalty is going to be a lot longer of a case. Well, like they are in this months. one. Are they, yeah. And yeah. otherwise it's going to be weeks. Although he kind of gets to the point of it and solves the case really quickly. And then mm -hmm. the mir miracle comes in at the end. Yes. That n rarely ever happens, but it's cool. And yeah. there's a lot of things in it that I really like. Like the part where she's like, my cousin, the daughter of my sister, is about to get married. <laughs> question, she's all this I get time. Like she's not getting married. But <laughs> her cousin's sister or whatever. The daughter of my sister is yeah, getting married yeah. and I haven't yet. Yeah. yeah. My favorite part is when she's talking about the cute little Dia. <laughs> <laughs> And then, bam! <laughs> now, to you tell me, would you care what shoes the guy? Would you? Hold on, I messed it up. So, 
would you care what color shoes the bastard that shot you is wearing? <laughs> He's like, <laughs> maybe it's greatness. More than any other, it is. What are you wearing? Indochino. Let's try that again. Oh, get my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Premier Clothiers by Keith Warshawski. Link in the description. He's good. <laughs> <laughs> if there is one comment that I get more than any other, it's whether my cousin Vinny is in fact legally accurate. It's certainly a favorite among lawyers. We quote this movie all the time. Two utes. What is a ute? So be oh, that's. The <laughs> <laughs> we do not pre-watch these. <laughs> Sure to comment in the form of an objection, which will either sustain or overrule, and stick around until the end of the video where I give my cousin Vinny a grade for legal realism. So, without further ado, let's dig in to my cousin Vinny. Oh, come on. His lights are on. God. <laughs> what are we gonna do now? It's probably nothing, all right? It might be a tail light or something. Just relax. We don't have any money for bail. Hell, we don't need money for bail. Nothing's happened now. Just relax. Nothing. We're getting pulled over, aren't we? You we stole something, didn't you? You're finished. finished. Shut up. Oh, I forgot some background here that actually helps explain the rest of this movie. The movie starts with two kids from New York who are driving through the South. Uh, the Karate Kid <laughs> from New York. <laughs> <laughs> They stop at a grocery store called the Sack O' Suds to pick up some supplies, and they accidentally leave with a can of tuna in their pocket without paying for it. Uh, they think that when the police pull them over, they're being pulled over for uh, accidentally shoplifting a can of tuna, when in fact, the store manager was murdered just after they left the store. Okay, so with that background, that will make the rest of this movie make a lot more sense. Show me your hands! Jesus. Show me your hands! Get him up! Get him up! Up! Over so a can of first tuna. <laughs> what did you say? Over a can of tuna, right? No. First indication that something is wrong is they're reacting that way. They're not going to react that way over a can of tuna mm. or over speeding or anything no. else. And so that's indication number one that something else is going on and you should watch what you're saying and preferably probably say nothing. Up. Now put your hands on top of your head and get out of the car. Out of the car! All right, so this is a case of mistaken identity, but it's important to note that when a policeman stops your car, it's generally considered a seizure for Fourth Amendment purposes. So generally speaking, the police may not stop your car unless they have at least reasonable suspicion to believe that the law has been violated. <laughs> Provided that the police have lawfully stopped the vehicle, the officer can order the occupants to get out in the name of officer safety. Here, all of those requirements are met. We have a murder that was conducted by people driving a very similar car who fit the description of the defendants here. So it's very likely that the police did in fact have probable cause to stop this car and were correct in ordering the occupants to get out of the car because of the grisly nature of the murder that just happened nearby. Correct. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm sure it's number three and five. Ridiculous, all this over a can of tuna. <laughs> Keep quiet. Okay, so that was a classic police lineup. The other thing is, is with this lineup, I might need to go back and watch the actual video because I think that they influenced this lineup with the setup of who these people were. Uh -huh. um, because you can, in a lineup, absolutely suggest who you think that the perpetrator are and say things that will indicate. And I always thought in a fine. lineup, too, they usually put people that look kind of similar. Oh, it totally just depends on who they've got. Oh, okay. And lineups... Because this lineup is like... Lineups are notoriously also... <laughs> completely unreliable mm. uh, in a lot of yeah. instances. There are a couple... Because it's like, pick the best one that looks the closest to the person that well, did it. This is and a they also example. imply that the killer is there, and it's one of them. Which one looks the most one like the person that you thought did it? Right. And so, it's all that a lineup is good for is... Well, it wasn't this one. A lineup is good for eliminating suspects mm -hmm. better than it is to include a suspect. Right. 
problems here. A defendant can attack the identification as denying due process when the identification, the lineup itself, is unnecessarily suggestive. Exactly. And there is a substantial likelihood of misidentification. Exactly. If we roll the clip back. The other thing is, is that you see this person for the first time and, uh, well, we've done multiple lineups. So you get into trial and that's the one that they've seen in the lineup. So they're now convinced that that's the person who did it. Mm -hmm. We can see that the two defendants here look nothing like the rest of the people in the lineup. They yep. are several feet shorter and far skinnier. Also, additionally, both of them are in the lineup at the same time. And that is likely to be unnecessarily suggestive and to create a false positive, which is exactly what happened here. Exactly. Well, a proven attorney from out of state is a pretty informal matter. That's true. And it's called Pro Hoc Vice. I actually have a case right now out of Colorado that it was we were this close for me having to do, but we've got it solved in a different way mm -hmm. without me having to go, which is great. And uh, but I've done it in many other instances. And you usually have to have a local counsel there with you to tell you certain things about the local rules. Mm -hmm. So you always have a local counsel. That is one of the things that I find to be an error in my cousin Vinny. They should have also had a second counsel there advising him about things like disclosure. <laughs> Well, they had the one guy who stuttered. Did they? Remember the kid selects the, like the. Oh, yeah, yeah. The co-counsel that yeah. was sitting there. Yeah. yeah. And that guy. Yeah. You can it, tell this is a comedy because <laughs> that guy's a complete and total moron. <laughs> I just have a few questions. Yeah, cool. This is a real thing. Mm -hmm. It's a motion called a Pro Hoc Vice motion where mm -hmm. an out-of-state attorney wants to uh, have temporary permission to practice in a state that they aren't licensed. Usually you have to be sponsored by another attorney, mm -hmm. but you always have to vouch and say that you are going to follow the laws of that state and jurisdiction when you apply. Yep. How long have you been practicing? Oh, about uh, six, uh, almost 16 years. Okay, <laughs> to my understanding, he just got his license recently, right? I don't even think he has his license No, yet. I think he had his license. No, because do you remember that Marissa Tomei is like calling and she's having oh, yeah. to get someone to help her and yeah. like, like so get it. So at the moment that that was found out, uh -huh. at least in Texas, he would be going to prison. Oh, yeah. Because it's a third degree felony. Uh -huh. And any judge is not going to take kindly to that at all. And it's a very factual matter. Did he have his license? Yes or no. You practiced in that courtroom. This judge is the witness of that. That's why at the end, they're trying to get out of there as fast as they can. Yeah. Out, he, of, out of the town. <laughs> but the deal is, is that if and when that ever got found out, he would be disbarred from any and every bar association mm -hmm. or, or jurisdiction in the United States. Period. Oh, yeah. Any murder cases? Lots of, quite a few, <laughs> yes. What was the outcome? Uh, you know, win some, lose some. <laughs> Never a good idea to lie to no, a judge. It's always a the really bad idea. The judge will find out eventually, and uh, you can be sanctioned both in the state that you are uh, trying to get into, but also the state that you come from as well. It's both. <clears throat> Mr. Gambini, stand up. <laughs> Not again. Now, didn't I tell you the next time you appear in my courtroom that you dress appropriately? You were serious about that? <laughs> <laughs> Judges are usually serious about everything that they say. Oh, yeah. Again, wear an actual suit and tie when you go to court. I really wish I could tell Joe Pesci. I, right now, would feel very self-conscious. I would never walk into a courtroom without a tie. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. You got to do it. Actually, where I get all of my suits from. Indochino. Indochino. <laughs> Hold on, I forgot the name. Premier Clothiers. Keith Warshawski. Link in the description. What's all that? Trotter's files. All of them. You stole his files? <laughs> Why'd you steal his files? Of course she would think that. Files. Listen to this. I'm just ready to finesse him. I'm starting to finesse him, right? I got him going. He offers to have his secretary copy everything for me. Yeah, he's yeah, it's called to. <laughs> a Brady motion, by the way, and you're required as a prosecutor to turn over all exculpatory material to the defense, mm -hmm. everything, and it's actually supposed to be done automatically. And she tells him that too. She's about She's, to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's very impressive finessing. 
Yeah, in reality, the reason that the prosecution would turn over materials to the defense is they have a constitutional obligation to do so. Yep. The government has a duty to disclose materials, certainly all exculpatory evidence, but generally that translates to all of the material that the prosecution has uh, under Supreme Court precedents, uh, specifically the 1963 case of Brady versus Maryland. Failure to disclose that evidence, whether willful or inadvertent, is a due process violation and will result in overturning the conviction. The prosecutor here was constitutionally obligated to turn over his files to Joe Pesci. He had nothing to do with his schmoozing. At all. Uh, and to not do so would be what's called a Brady violation and could have resulted in overturning the conviction if he was able to get a conviction. And there are times when a prosecutor will attempt not to, and you file what's called a Brady motion. You bring that to the judge's attention and say they have these certain things that I'm aware of that they haven't turned over, mm -hmm. and they'll have to turn it over to you. But it's supposed to be absolutely automatic. Don't you want to know why Trotter gave you his files? I told you why. He has to. By law, you're entitled. <laughs> oh, call disclosure, you dickhead. <laughs> you just said that. Nice job, Marissa Tomei. <laughs> she has to show you everything, otherwise it could be a mistrial. You know she won an Academy Award for this for Beck's Supporting Actress. She was it? amazing She was awesome. Movie. Yeah, she was. He has to give you a list of all his witnesses. You can talk to all his witnesses. He's not allowed any surprises. Yep. Gone she are knows the days more about law, the law than he does at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in one afternoon of reading in the, in the book. Pretty at you, you know, young lawyers a lot of times will be so paranoid that they're just reading and reading and reading and reading and looking and searching the books for that. And you go through that for the first few years of your practice when at least the good attorneys do, uh, because a really good attorney will know that they know nothing, nothing at all on their first day of practice. You've gone through law school, you've gotten your law license and you know how to do absolutely nothing. And you need to go to work for somebody like me or your husband, Daniel, um, mm -hmm. at our firm where we mentor young attorneys and teach them everything that they need to know. And if there's a young attorney who just got their license and they put on their resume, I have extensive knowledge in fill in the blank, they do not get hired because no young attorney has extensive knowledge in anything. Mm -hmm. Experience in the profession of law is what it's all about. The more experience that you got, the better of an attorney that you're going to be. Right. Trial agree. prosecution has to turn over not only their evidence, but as part of the pretrial filings, you have to disclose who the witnesses are that you're going to rely yep. on. And in civil trials, you have to disclose who the witnesses are too, not just criminal. Mm -hmm. As a interesting aside, though, as the defense attorney, and I could be wrong because I haven't practiced criminal defense in a while, but to my understanding, you don't have to turn to turn over your witness list to the prosecution. Hmm. I could be wrong so that no one is sandbagged when they actually get to trial. That doesn't help anyone. They didn't teach you that in law school either? Nope, a lot of times they don't. <laughs> it's not. Are you mocking me with that outfit? <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. No, I'm not mocking you, Judge. Then explain that outfit. I bought a suit. You've seen it. Now it's covered in mud. This town doesn't have a one-hour cleanest, so I had to buy a new suit. Except that the only store you could buy a new suit in has got the flu. You get that? The whole store got the flu. <laughs> so I had to get this in a secondhand store. Joe Pesci could really use a place where he could get affordable custom made suits so he could actually have more than one. Okay, he's going to plug his suits. We're going to skip it. We got it. He's <laughs> plugged it like three times. Uh, that actually is sort of a problem for me, though, because my suits do take six weeks to come in. Uh -huh. uh, Keith comes and measures me. He'll fly anywhere around the country and make suits for people. Mm -hmm. And he measures me and then has it custom made and then brings it and makes sure that it f all fits me right. And so it takes about six weeks. Well, <clears throat> I recently lost about 30 pounds over the past year and a half, and that was mm -hmm. during COVID time. So I wasn't having to show up for court. All of a sudden, I have a court appearance, and I put on a suit, and it looks like I'm wearing... Uh, some other person's suit is just enveloping me mm -hmm. and looked like I was wearing a bedspread. So <laughs> I had to have Keith come out and make me a suit. Well, I yeah. only got two suits right now. I still only have those two suits. I recently did a jury trial, which was over four days and I only had two suits and the two suits, as you can see with this blue one, 
quite noticeable. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you can only get one day. My other one is is not as noticeable, but still mm-hmm. somewhat noticeable. It's blue with a, a red, red checkerboard in uh-huh. it. So yeah, I'm I'm getting some more suits from you <laughs> now that now that the courts are are open again. I'm yeah. Yeah. I'll take drugs. I don't like your attitude. What else is no? I'm holding you in contempt of court. <laughs> so, interestingly, if the jury is in the room when he's being held in contempt for that or mm-hmm. during that behavior, that's grounds to get the trial uh, reversed and for grounds for a new trial. Can oh, be. Wow. Um, and I have seen some judges around here that recently I saw a judge that I would have thought he's going to put that person in jail for contempt and hold him as a contempt mm-hmm. charge. Well, the guy was already going to jail for something else, so the judge didn't bother to add a contempt charge on there because then it's arguable that another judge has to hear the hearing mm. for contempt. Yeah. And the the case could be removed from that court. So he strategically, I think, didn't hold him in contempt. But when sentencing time actually comes for that trial, mm-hmm. the defendant is not going to like it. Yeah. The chances of him having any kind of probation are gone. Right. Oh, it is a f- surprise. What'd you say? <laughs> what? What'd you just say? <laughs> Don't talk back to the judge. Quit while you're ahead. Or quit while you're slightly behind. <laughs> this movie is so great. Counsel, members of the jury, the evidence in this case is going to show that at 9.30 in the morning of January 4th, both defendants... Stanley Rothenstein and William Gambini were seen getting out of their metallic green 1964 Buick Skylark convertible with a white top. The evidence is going to show that they were seen... You know what's funny? When they pulled them over, I could swear the car was white. Really? I don't recall the car being metallic green (laughs) in the beginning of the movie. (laughs) Interesting. I do. And you have just now demonstrated the unreliability of eyewitness testimony. Mm-hmm. Entering the Sackersuds convenience store in Wazoo City. Wazoo City for the Sackersuds. The Sack evidence is going to show that minutes after they entered the Sackersuds, a gunshot was heard by three eyewitnesses. You're going to then hear the testimony of the three eyewitnesses who saw the defendants running out of the Sackersuds a moment after the shots were heard, getting into their faded metallic green 1964 Buick Skylark and driving off in great haste. In Maybe it's because it mid, was faded. In the <laughs> mid 80s, my parents both had a Buick Skylark each. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I think my dad had like a blue one and my mom had like a white one or something. But I remember us having at least one blue Buick Skylark and it had the long bucket mm-hmm. seat with just the, the seat belt in the middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not long, long they bench They don't seat. make cars like they used to. The I mean, those yeah. type of cars, if you got a wreck, it's like it wouldn't have done anything. <laughs> yeah, just, you just bounce around inside. <laughs> All right. I really, really, really like the prosecutor's opening statement in this movie. Oh, yeah. It's very good. Oh, yeah. That was very, very good. There are a couple things that he's doing that actually rarely happen correctly in the movies. Number one, this prosecutor is giving a short summary of what the evidence will show. Opening statements are about essentially priming the jury for the story that is going to be elicited through the evidence and through the witnesses. The thing that I have a problem with in a lot of movies is they rarely show Vore Dyer, Mm -hmm. which is where the jury is selected. More importantly, actually more correctly described, it's the jurors are deselected Mm -hmm. and then you're left with the first 12 that are there because that's your real opening statement. That's where you're priming them. Do they do that in 12 Angry Men? Well, we'll find which out when is, we watch that one. Which is a great movie. I haven't seen it. You've never seen 12 Angry Men? Not yet, but we'll watch it on the channel. Oh. <laughs> so this prosecutor is doing a fantastic job of yeah, explaining what the evidence will show. On top of that, this prosecutor is doing a great job of using the space in front of the jury, uh, while also at the same time maintaining a respectful distance away from the jury box. Yep. If you enter the well and go straight to the area right in front of the jury, the judge is going to have a huge problem with that. But I like that he starts at counsel table, talks about what the evidence is going to show, and specifically to highlight the 
testimony of a specific witness, he then walks over mm -hmm. towards the witness stand and gestures to where the testimony is going to come from. So he is being dramatic and somewhat theatrical, but within the bounds of what someone would actually do in a way that makes rhetorical sense. Mm -hmm. Rhetorical sense is very important because it's very much about a story that you're telling and oh, yeah. a narrative. And if your narrative falls apart, your complete believability is gone. Right. It's all about the story. Counselor, do you wish to make an open statement? <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> he, seems, he seems just completely destroyed, but it, th no, I think this was after because he stayed awake all night, all night trying to read through the books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that actually was probably one of the more this accurate This is what parts. I think happened, what I remember. He went to law school, but he hasn't passed the bar yet. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like trying to, yeah. That's yep. where he's at. But he's trying to hide that part. Counselor. Gotcha. I have never <laughs> seen lead trial counsel fall asleep at counsel table. but it's, it's about impossible to do because the adrenaline is like nothing else. I probably have been on roller coasters with less adrenaline than you get when you're sitting there. Oh, yeah. I can't. A lot of what it is imagine. is that. Yeah. You are very, very aware mm -hmm. and 100 percent present when you're in a jury trial. And at least, I don't know, I am because right. I'm a good attorney. I guess I've heard of other attorneys that are completely checked out or drunk or high, um, which unfortunately can happen. But mm -hmm. for, I would say, the vast, vast majority, but especially me. But this and, is a murder trial. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'm like, and how do you pass out? Well, at the end of the day, it's real easy to pass out once you get home. Oh, yeah. Because you're going to sleep real well, and you're almost non-functional because it takes so much energy. It's like mm -hmm. running a marathon mm -hmm. worth of energy, but having to sit still. It's a oh, lot of energy it. to even sit still, and you, you're always wanting to sit there and just jump out of the seat. Yeah. I have 100% seen other attorneys who are at counsel table fall asleep. I've seen members of the jury fall asleep during the trial. Oh, yeah. I've seen oh, people yeah. in the gallery fall that. asleep at, at trial. Yeah. I've actually seen a bailiff fall asleep in mm. a trial once. I've seen him fighting it. A lot of the trial process is actually pretty boring and mundane. Pretty boring and And it's mundane. not uncommon to see people fall asleep. Just not the head, head trial. trial. <laughs> Did he... We got to pull it. Did he stay up all night trying to prep for it because plenty of times you don't sleep the night before. Well, trial. this is where, cause he's wearing that ridiculous suit. Mm -hmm. So remember they, they're in that storm, they're in that cabin and then they had to go. They, I think they lose power or something and they could get in their car and they like drive and they're out in the wood area and then their tire gets stuck in the mud. Oh, I remember all and that. And then he yeah. goes back to the back of the, his suits in the trunk uh -huh. and he gets all muddy and he's like, then that's how he got that suit because I get back in town. And she's like, I'll go get your suit. You go, you know, whatever. She tells, they tell each other they're doing opposite things. So, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, everything that guy just says. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> would that work? <laughs> it might. <laughs> it might. Would the judge let you get away with that? Hell no. I don't know. Let's see what the judge did here. Thank you. In addition to being vulgar and disrespectful to the court. It would probably make the jury not like you at all, but that could be turned. If yeah. they realize if there's some kind of moments, which he actually does do, I could see that happening. I think but it would make attorney, the jury think he's not credible. <laughs> yeah, I think you would immediately lose most of your credibility and you would be in a sinking ship the entire time mm -hmm. if you did that. Mm -hmm. But maybe, and he gets really, really lucky, but I wouldn't want to count on luck. No. That's technically an argument and not allowed as your opening statement. Mr. Tipton, when you viewed the defendants walking from their car into the sack of suds... So one thing that's usually not accurate you're not going to be able to walk up and stand right there at counsel table yeah. and ask the witness That's questions. That's kind of intimidating. Plus, you're also <laughs> not going to have your voice be loud enough for the jury to really hear you. It's not going to be particularly effective, right. although it's very effective for TV purposes because the camera can zoom in and see both the witness and the lawyer at the same mm -hmm. time. So this is a TV thing. Otherwise, you're going to be asking all of your questions from counsel But table. I do like how he figures this point, this part out. Oh, I do too. <laughs> what angle was your point of view? 
they was kind of walking. In fact, the fact this this particular lesson is something that I use often because I want to know exactly where you were standing mm-hmm. when this happened, exactly how, how far the distance was. How did you see that far? Where were you standing? What direction? But it's not even just that. It's what was he doing? And what was he doing? He was making grits. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, I do love me some grits. So, and I always, every time I eat grits, every time I eat grits, I think of this scene. <laughs> toward me when they entered the store. And when he asked them, are they instant it's grits? No, or? Southern me. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So I got you in 15 minutes, bro. When they left, what angle was your point of view? He was kind of walking away from me. So, would you say you got a better shot of them going in and not so much coming out? You could say that. I did say that. Would you say that? Yeah. This is really good. The testimony was ambiguous, and so Joe Pesci here follows up and confirms that the witness does in fact agree with the statement. It's actually a very, very good technique. It was very good. That Joe Pesci has said. That is a very crucial thing that a lot of lawyers miss. It's so... Exactly. I really think that this scene is one of the best teaching methods Mm-hmm. on teaching a trial attorney how to do a cross-examination that you can do. Mm-hmm. This is a really good example. Oh, yeah. Easy when you're in the heat of cross-examination that you just assume that the you testimony You assume the testimony and move on. You always have to be thinking of what is the record going to show. And there's a scene in My Cousin Vinny mm-hmm. where it talks about the difference between how a record reads and what was really said. And it's the part where he says, yeah, I did it. And those, those types of things. We'll mm-hmm. get to that. <clears throat> you think it is when in reality we're really unreliable narrators. So it's a great idea to make sure and, and summarize and get the uh, witness to actually state exactly what it is you want exactly. them to prove. Yeah. And on top of that, when you're getting good testimony, it's a great idea to get the witness to repeat the thing that is actually good for you. Absolutely. So great- because <laughs> if you got a juror that's asleep, they just missed it and you need to catch that. Right, And at that point, if you were at, at the stand, I might loop a, a walking lap through the jurors and I might even like, you know, do that on the front panel of the jury box to make sure and snap them out of that. And to repeat hear the it. whole scenario again might, and make that person reconfirm. Can you do that? Can you get away with that if I was there? That's one of the things that as a trial attorney, I'm being conscious of because I am always being conscious of the perception of the jury. Mm-hmm and what's going on and i'm going to take advantage of any opportunity if i happen to be up there i would do something like yeah. that yeah job by joe pesci here so far is it possible to two youths here's the, the youths to what <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was that word uh what word to what what did you say youths yeah two youths what is a youth excuse me your honor two youths that's great because again in the heat of cross examination sometimes people slur their words sometimes the court reporter can't take down exactly what was said where people kind of talk over each other so it is a real thing where the judge or particularly the stenographer will actually stop the testimony to clarify and of course this is probably I would say that you get a stenographer stopping you at least once every half day Oh, yeah. At least. Mm-hmm. On average. Mm-hmm. I see it almost every time that we go into court. The most mm-hmm. classic scene in the entire movie. And it's, it's just hilarious because there's a kernel of truth in it. Is it possible the two defendants entered the store, <laughs> picked 22 specific items off of the shelves, had the clerk take money, make change, then leave. Then two different men drive up in a similar... Don't shake your head. I'm not done yet. Wait till you hear the whole thing. So you can understand. You do have to do that. Yeah. You do have to do that too. Understand this now. Two different men drive up in a similar looking car, go in, shoot the clerk, rob him, and then leave? No. They didn't have enough time. Well, how much time? And you will have witnesses that absolutely are convinced and believe that and that the actual truth, which turns out here, could not even be possible. Well, it's also people's perception of time is... Exactly. Exactly. Have you ever been to a restaurant and someone complains, I've been waiting 20 minutes, mm-hmm. but then you sat them and you can actually see what time you sat them and it could have been three minutes. Six minutes. Or Yeah. yeah. But in their reality, like yeah. it's been way longer than... Yeah. So yeah. 
this guy isn't right. Was they in the store? And as a trial attorney, you have to be conscious of that. Five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. Are you sure? Did you look at your watch? No. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. That's right. That's a good way to say it. Mm -hmm. Did you look at your watch? No, I didn't. Yeah. You testified earlier that the boys went into the store and you had just begun to make breakfast. You were just ready to eat and you heard a gunshot. That's, That's right. right. I'm sorry. So obviously it takes you five minutes to make breakfast. That's right. All right. So you knew that. Cereal and milk. Uh, <laughs> you remember what you But. The, like five minutes the real to question make that breakfast. You, well, the real question that you have here, because this turns on the fact that it takes 15 minutes to make non-instant grits. grits. Yeah. And the real question that you have is, do you lock him into how long the grits take to make mm -hmm. first, or do you lock him into how much time it was? Right. I think he did it right in this one. Mm -hmm. Lock him into he sure that it was only five minutes. Mm -hmm. And then you expose him at the end, because there's also always two concepts, primacy and recency. Mm -hmm. Primacy means first, prime, the first thing that they hear. Mm -hmm. And that's going to stick in a juror's mind better. But then recency, what's the most recent, which is the last thing. Right. And he finishes with his real hook of, oh, wow, it's not what this guy thinks, mm -hmm. which is one of his themes to go forward. And to discredit this witness, he did this brilliantly. Mm -hmm. This is one, th this uh, witness can be taught in any trial advocacy class in any law school in the country. Mm -hmm. Had eggs and grits. So Joe Pesci is being a little bit argumentative here, but what he's doing is he is setting a factual and logical trap exactly. for the witness to show that the witness doesn't have the kind of veracity or truthfulness that would be necessary to convict for mm -hmm. beyond a reasonable doubt. If you yep. can show that a witness is lying or can't be trusted on one thing, members of the jury are far less likely to believe them on most of the rest of their testimony. That, that is true. And that is exactly why you don't want to lie about anything in in a court hearing. And you need to prepare to be telling the truth about whatever it is. That's one of the reasons why Johnny Depp won his trial and Amber Heard right. lost. Because you could tell Amber Heard was even lying about other things that mm -hmm. just didn't make sense. Right. Whereas Johnny Depp, when especially all of the bad things of how much do you drink, all these other things he he readily admitted and showed his weaknesses and his flaws mm -hmm. and his attorneys were always prepared to deal with that and they always they did a great job about that mm -hmm. um but if you go in and they find one little or simple thing that you lied about then you are a liar and they're not going to believe anything and and there are lawyers that will make small mistakes on things and this is why little errors on punctuation or grammar something that a, a normal lay person can detect that if they find an error there will they think oh well you're making errors on everything mm -hmm. when in reality you're probably spot on on all of your legal work but this the punctuation error or spelling or different things like that or that it doesn't look right looks off to them and so it causes them to have doubt about everything that you did mm -hmm. and so well i think if you're going to be a witness too like, oh, if you're going to be a witness, you yeah, have to tell the truth. Be honest. I mean, if I was a witness, I would want to make sure I had all my facts straight. Mm -hmm. Because someone's life is in your hands, especially in a criminal case. Someone's life is like, I mean, right. if you tell the wrong information, yep. you might be putting someone in jail for the rest of your life yep. or to death. I mean, in some cases. Yep. So, got to be yeah. accurate. Yeah. That can be really, really important for disproving the testimony of an eyewitness. Instant grits? No self-respect and suddenly <laughs> uses instant grits. I take pride in my grits. And he looked over at a juror and got her confirmation yeah. on it. And now that juror is going to realize, oh, wow, there's something else to this. And yeah, but she, she was like respecting him, the witness, yes. at that moment because he's talking about how... Right. So she's like, okay, I, I like this witness. Totally but, plays into Vinny's hands. Yes. Exactly. Yes. And by the way, those are the times, there are plenty of times in trial where we're, we're, we'll turn and look at something happened and look to see what the jury's reaction is to certain mm -hmm. things. And that's how we know how a trial is going. Right. So, Mr. Tipton, how could it take you? And you notice he's now talking to the jury mm -hmm. and he's moving to the jury. Just like I mentioned a minute ago. Yeah. Five minutes to cook your grits when it takes the entire grit-eating world <laughs> 20 minutes. 
So it's a great question because <laughs> there's no good answer for the witness. And additionally, it relies on facts, not in evidence, that grits actually right. take 20 minutes. In real life, he would have had to have this witness establish that grits take 20 minutes. That's exactly right. Right. But, you know, movies limited on time. I would have been like, how long does it take you to make not instant grits? Yeah. And, instant but, grits take five and minutes. As so we how all long know, does it here's take? how I would have did it. And I would have looked to that same witness that that he nodded to that mm -hmm. she's basically gone. We all know that instant grits take 20 minutes. I would have gone to that witness and gone, and we all know that instant grits don't take 20 minutes. Yeah. And lo and looked at her, and, and she would have gone, yeah, and then she's my juror now. Yeah. To cook. So you got to be really, really careful when you're doing a tactic like what Joe Pesci is doing. And it can work out, but it's very, very dangerous on cross because you don't know which way it's going to go. Well, what are these pictures of? I love this one, too. That's actually accurate. You do have to ask, what's, mm -hmm. what are these pictures of? My house and, and at that point, you would approach the witness and maybe show them the pictures, mm -hmm. or sometimes you... You wouldn't be doing this, though. Well, you can. It just you depends can. on the judge. It, it, I, I've seen it done like this, and it really just depends on the court. Uh, normally, you're going to have it blown up, usually, or maybe you'll have an original, and it'll be marked at a certain exhibit number, and mm -hmm. then you'll be asking them questions again from Yeah, because that's usually how table. I see them do it. They hand mm -hmm. over the pictures, and, they're say, and they oh, say, yeah. please review these, and but then again, tell me what... Exhibit for, A is. For blocking purposes, which uh -huh. is how you appear on camera, yeah. this allows the witness and the lawyer to be in the same picture. Yes. So that's why it's done this way. <laughs> yeah. Stuff. House and stuff. And uh, what is this brown stuff on the windows? Dirt. Dirt. And you notice how he looked at the jury to make sure that they were looking. Mm -hmm. What is this rusty, dusty, dirty looking thing over your window? It's a screen. A screen. It's a screen. <laughs> and what are these really big things right in the middle of your view from the window of your kitchen to the sack of suds? What do we call these big things? <laughs> Trees? I absolutely love what Joe Pesci is doing <laughs> He's right like, here. Yeah, he is using effectively <laughs> incontrovertible evidence. No yeah. one's going to dispute what these things are in the photos. How but do he you is, have a good view? And the other and thing you is, look at that and you're like, the other how thing can is he, he is anything? he is taking his sweet time with this witness and pointing out the obvious, nonsensical, and mm -hmm. completely discrediting this witness. Oh yeah. And he's doing it in a very short way, as opposed to just getting it in, getting it in, getting it in, mm -hmm. and then arguing it later. He's mm -hmm. really emphasizing and showing the, 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 the point and going to look at this to yeah. the jury. Walking the witness down a logical path that he's not going to be able to get out of, which is that there's a lot of stuff between his vantage point and the events that he is an eyewitness to. And thankfully, Vinny went and got these pictures and did mm -hmm. his, it's called due diligence. Diligence, yeah. And checked out all of this stuff. Yeah. And you have to be smart enough to anticipate and know yeah, that. Yeah, because he goes to all the witnesses' houses and mm -hmm. stuff, right? Yes, Doesn't he, does. he check? Yeah, because yeah. I remember that because he takes pictures with this camera. Uh -huh. And there's always been a question, and this is actually a But can you do that in real life? Can you go to you witnesses' can. houses? Most of the time that you'll have a detective or an investigator oh, okay. do that mm -hmm. because... If you're there and you happen to catch yourself up as a witness, mm -hmm. then y you wind up disqualifying yourself as an attorney. Okay. And so there's this fine line. Have I done this? And especially when I was a younger attorney doing criminal defense, would I do it? Yeah, I would. Uh -huh. Because I always thought this is a really good idea that Vinny did. I wonder if this is going to work in real life. And turns out it does. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why direct evidence through eyewitness testimony can be actually very, very unreliable. But what Joe Pesci is doing is he is just having the witness agree to just these tiny little facts. And there's no way to dispute all of the little breadcrumbs he's getting on his trail to get to the ultimate conclusion that his eyewitness testimony is not really that believable so the questions are fantastic the yep. only thing i would have liked to have seen is a projector or an elmo that displays these photos <laughs> in uh, a we do blow have those so in all the jury yes. can also see exactly what it is that the witness is referring to <laughs> you could positively identify the defendants for a moment of two seconds looking through this dirty window 
this crud-covered screen, these trees with all these leaves on them, and I don't know how many bushes. I like the council. <laughs> yeah. It's like and a, wi- a witness, I'm not kidding you, a witness will do this from the stand. Uh-huh. This is not an this is not an unrealistic type of witness. Yeah. Eh, don't forget this one and this one. Seven bushes. Seven bushes. So, what do you think? Is it possible you just saw two guys in a green convertible and not necessarily these two particular guys? Well, I suppose. And what you see is reasonable doubt. Yeah. Here is that the answer that the witness provides. That's it doesn't all matter. It doesn't matter. The witness yeah. here it's can agree or the witness doubt. can not agree. But the sign of a good cross is that you don't actually care right. what the witness is going to say. In exactly. fact, if he had said that it was a perfect identification, he would have lost credibility mm-hmm. based on all of the things that Joe Pesci just talked about here. So that is the sign of a masterful cross examination. I would recommend all lawyers watch this particular cross examination. Yes, of this it was witness. fantastic. The best. Both of them. Mm-hmm. Both of these so yes. far. I'm a special automotive instructor of forensic studies for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh huh. How long you been in that position? 18 years. Your Honor. He's cr- qualifying this witness as an expert. Mm-hmm. Uh, may we approach the bench, please? If you wish. If you wish. The judge hates them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I object to this witness being called at this time. We've been given no prior notice he'd testify. Oh. That's actually a good objection. Mm-hmm. No discovery of any tests he's conducted or reports he's prepared. And as the court is aware, the defense is entitled to advance notice of any witness who will testify, particularly to those who will give scientific evidence so that we could properly prepare for cross-examination, as well as to give the defense an opportunity to have the witnesses' reports reviewed by a defense Judge's expert case. who might then be in a position to contradict the veracity of his conclusions. Perfect. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and watch the judge. He, the prosecution see. here has made a huge mistake, which is... He denies him. <laughs> Does he? Yeah. We'll see. They made the foundation <laughs> for how this guy is a credible expert who can testify in court. So there's really only he tells two... Him it's a very good... He says that was a very good statement or whatever. Does he? And, d- then, d- and, then, then, he, and then he goes, oh, thank you, Your Honor. And he goes, denied. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? There are plenty of times where that happens too. <laughs> yeah. There are times uh, I see things like that more with leading objections or certain mm-hmm. things because it, it, there are times when, especially early on in a trial, you're objecting to leading and the judge is sustain, sustaining your objections. And then all of a sudden, the leading is still going on and the judge is overruling your objections. The judge is probably telegraphing to you, shut up, let him finish. I'm ready to get out of here. You're already going to win. Right. (laughs) Kinds of witnesses. There are lay witnesses who can only testify to things they actually perceive. And then there are experts who are allowed to testify to their opinions on things based on the evidence presented to them. And under rule 702 of the rules of procedure, the expert has to have scientific, technical, or specialized knowledge that will help the trier of fact. Uh, The testimony has to be based on sufficient facts or data. The testimony has to be the product of reliable principles and methods, and the expert has to have reliably applied the principles and methods to the case at hand. So on top of uh, FRE 702... And by the way, all the states have their own different rules of evidence and procedure, but a lot of them mirror and have similar numbers to the federal rules. You also have to meet the Daubert standard. So he pronounces it Daubert. A lot of people pronounce it Daubert. It's Daubert. Daubert. It's actually a Texas case from a good old boy named Daubert who calls himself Daubert. So we pronounce it like the litigant does. The proper pronunciation is Daubert. Daubert. Which is meant to give the court the gatekeeping function to prevent junk science from getting into the court. There is no way that these tire marks were made by a 64 Buick Skylark. These marks were made by a 1963 Pontiac Tempest. Objection, Your Honor. Can we clarify to the court whether the witness is stating opinion or fact? This is your opinion? It's a fact. I find it... It's actually opinion. (laughs) That this kind... Uh... Opinion or fact? Mm. I think it can be a fact because she's actually stating why. Because the way of the... 
the I, I would uh, say extend, that's is it the rear extension yeah. on the well, car? No, it's the so the, the tires like she said the, the differential. Yeah. What a differential is is it something that allows tires to spin at different paces. Yeah, and she and says this, this one, one will went even it would have been even. a locked differential to where the tires had to spin at the same pace. Yeah, to I make think. that because one went up. So one went up on the curb, and she's saying that they made the tire marks, whereas the other car would have not done that. It would have because it was flat, and so you see yeah. the tire marks both both ways. And so if yeah. it's like this on the curb, both wheels were still. Mm -hmm. spinning and spinning evenly so this whole tire would have had to go up yeah which whoever wrote this and if that's true whoever wrote this was so clever yeah thumbs up to them you could have <laughs> but and it could have literally been that one fact uh -huh. that allowed the whole rest of the movie to be written and somebody come up with the idea of the movie i would yeah. love to talk to the writer of my cousin Vinny mm -hmm. to find out how they came up with that or first we should check is that a real thing yeah, to do some due diligence on this. If the cars are very similar, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and how they came up with that, and how that piece got assembled into the final. Yeah, puzzle. we should put that into the podcast. We should. The differences between the two cars. I wonder. I wonder if the yeah we should. I wonder if the writer of my cousin Vinny is still alive. We should reach out to them and get them. Kind of information could be ascertained simply by looking at a picture. Would you like me to explain? This I would love to hear funny. this. Okay, boom, right there, sitting on the other council table. <laughs> <laughs> no, not gonna happen. Look at his face. <laughs> yeah, not gonna happen. Maybe sitting on his own council table could could get away with. Maybe I doubt it. I might be able to get away with it because I'm standing there with a cane in, in court anyway. And, and have to do that in order to stand still or whatever. And the other thing is I have so much adrenaline pumping through my body that if I don't have something to stand and, and lean on, my back is just going to start throbbing. Pounding. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> the car that made these two equal length tire marks had positive traction. Can't make those marks without positive traction, which was not available on the 64 Buick Skylark. And why not? What is positive traction? Great and brilliant that he said yes. that because you need to go into that. It's a limited slip differential which distributes power equally to both the right and left tires. The 64 Skylark had a regular differential, <laughs> which anyone like who's been stuck in, in the mud in Alabama knows. You step on the gas, one tire spins, the other tire does nothing. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> a great direct examination by yep. Joe Pesci and great testimony by Marissa Tomei. Unlike in cross-examination, where the attorney is the star and the witness's answers are almost irrelevant, it's the absolute opposite on direct examination. Yep. There, you want all eyes on the witness and what direct examination is, is where you're doing your witness. Mm -hmm. Cross-examination is where you're taking testimony from the other side's witness. Mm -hmm. And in direct examination, you have to ask only open-ended questions. You can't ask them questions that can only be answered with a yes or no, which are called uh, leading questions. Mm -hmm. So it's that, is the label on this red yes or no? That's a leading question. Now, the leading question would also suggest the answer. This bottle has a red label on it. Doesn't it? That's a leading question. Mm -hmm. An open-ended question is, what color is the label on this bottle? When you're cross-examining someone, you are the one that wants to testify. And you mm -hmm. want to say, and this is a bottle of frankincense oil, isn't it? And this little bottle is something that is a miracle and everybody should try this out, isn't it? You know, yes or no. Right. Um, as opposed to if you're doing a direct examination, it's you got to go, what is this? What's in the bottle? What is this used for? Mm -hmm. Those type of questions. And it's a very, very different dynamic. You're the one essentially testifying in a cross-examination. They're the one essentially testifying in a direct examination. Mm -hmm. And all you're doing is asking questions that allow the witness to expand, and you're softly guiding where you want the witness to go. That's exactly a good point, that you're softly guiding. And right. a lot of times, if you want a thing called a, a narrative, which mm -hmm. is a longer answer, you have to break that narrative up with things like, questions like, and then what happened? And then what happened? Mm -hmm. Because a narrative answer in itself is actually objectionable. It's, and the objection is narrative or non-responsive mm -hmm. after a certain point in the answer. And if that's sustained, and you've let them go on on this long narrative, if it's sustained, all that testimony is then out and stricken, and you have to go back mm -hmm. to 
not even sure where, and try and then get that testimony back out of the witness because the objection was sustained. Right. I had a jury trial recently where I had about a five-minute narrative answer going on, and the testimony was great, and opposing side was not objecting. And finally, I go, and then what happened? And then they answered another, and I'm like, great. That whole thing was is in now. Because yeah. if they if I ask another question, they can't mm-hmm. go back and object to the one that's already been answered. And so I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was great. I didn't even want to interrupt anything, mm-hmm. but I had to. And the whole courtroom was shocked that I even said anything. That's how powerful everything was. Mm-hmm. And the other side was just wanting mm-hmm. to get through this because yeah. the witness was destroying them. And the witness was kind of surprised. And the jury was surprised. The judge was surprised. Everyone was surprised, even me. And I was the one that asked the question <laughs> <laughs> and he said, what? And I said, and, and then I go, well, then what happened? And then we moved back on. And, and so that's a big issue. Uh, Joe Pesci's questions are fantastic. Essentially what happened next? Or can you explain why that is? Yep. What is that technical term that you just used? Yep. He's using great open-ended questions. Yep. He's not leading her anywhere. And he is letting the witness be the star. Now, and the other thing, he's leading her a little bit because he's going, and why is that? They're telling this story together. And right. that is perfect harmony on a direct uh-huh. examination. In the 60s, there were only two other cars made in America that had positive traction and independent rear suspension and enough power to make these marks. One was the Corvette, which could never be confused with the Buick Skylark. <laughs> the other had the same body length, height, width, weight, wheelbase, and wheel track as the 64 Skylark, and that was the 1963 Pontiac Tempest. And because... See that right there? Uh Uh-huh. You do not do that. The whole jury is going to be watching and his own expert confirming the other expert with the body language? You do not do that. You do not dare do that. No. Sure. You wait, and then you go back out in the hall, or you take a break or something, and you ask him out there outside the presence of the jury. Because on a break, the jury goes behind in the back area, and the, they have their own restrooms, their own jury room, yeah. and you're out completely on the other side. Yeah, big mistake, but <laughs> great for TV Yeah, the Both movie. cars were made by GM. Were both cars available in metallic mint green paint? They what? Objection leading might have been sustained because her answer was they were, which is a yes answer. And be, he goes, because he led her right there because they were both made by General Motors Corporation. Right. Um, the way that he would have, if that objection would have gotten he sustained. He should have asked her who made these vehicles. Yes. And she would have said General Motors. And what color paint were available well, for both of those vehicles? vehicles. Metallic you, mint green. Y- yes. Or if she had to do the full list, you know, depend. If she was a bad witness, she would have gone. Well, I don't know all the different colors, and then maybe you can. Sometimes you can get away with a little bit of it. Of was it in metallic green paint? Yeah, metallic green tint. But this is brilliant. Thank you, Ms. Vito. No more questions. Thank you very, very much. And do not kiss your witnesses. (laughs) You do not do this. You've been a lovely witness. <laughs> lovely witness. <laughs> probably not appropriate. And now her testimony was probably not believable and because he just demonstrated how biased she is for him. Yes. So, yeah, she's an expert. How and do you know he, she's not lying about yeah, this? Yeah. You would have to bring his uh, the other side's expert back on to confirm. But that he does er- do that. Does he? <laughs> yes. Oh, he does. Well, that's brilliant. But God, it's a perfect scene. How can you just not love that direct examination? Apparently, a lot of people did because she got an Academy Award for yeah, that. And Marissa Tomei's <laughs> expert opinion. Fantastic. Amazing. <laughs> Okay. What I wish he would have gone through was he does the, bring the other guy back, and then he asks the other guy, and the guy like because he goes, "Isn't she lovely?" And he goes, "Yes, very." <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> so that part is critical. The other part is about why you don't talk to the police or how they because they took a confession. Mm-hmm. If they didn't have that confession, this case would have been a whole lot more difficult. But well, 
and that's another thing. If you go back to the beginning of the movie and they did take them in, they think it's over tuna fish. Yeah. So they're like admitting to something yeah. without asking, like, why am I here? Mm-hmm. Why did you arrest me? Mm-hmm. They don't ask those questions. Right. They say, well, and they don't have to tell you either. They admit they admit to it, but they're thinking it's over the can of tuna fish. Yeah. And the, so, like, if you get arrested, don't you need to find out why you're there. Yeah. And then you need to ask for a lawyer. Yes. <laughs> and you need to use your right to remain silent. And there's yes. also a recent, well, not so recent anymore, but within the past five to ten years, there is a decision from the Supreme Court that says. You must actually speak and invoke your right to remain silent. Mm-hmm. It's one of the biggest Supreme Court decisions that I disagree with, mm-hmm. which is the I think the fact that you remain silent is literally you invoking your right to remain silent because you're using your right to remain silent. Mm-hmm. But apparently, if you actually want to invoke that right, you have to speak it to the person and you have to say, I wish to remain silent. Hmm. So what you do is you invoke your right to remain silent and you invoke your right to counsel. I wish to remain silent until after I talk to my lawyer. Well, don't. I want to talk to my lawyer right now. May I please talk to my lawyer? Well, don't when they arrest you tell you no. you must remain silent. No. No. They oh, this is a common misconception okay. too. Uh, okay. And this is very I've very I've never important. been arrested so I don't know this. Well, part. that's good. There's always a first time and God forbid you ever get arrested <laughs> well, for anything. Let's hope I don't. No, so I do hope you don't. So, <laughs> um, so they don't have to read you Miranda rights when you're arrested. Mm. They only have to read you Miranda rights in order to interrogate you. But they can actually interrogate you without reading you your Miranda rights. Mm. They just won't be able to use any of your answers against you, but they'll have the knowledge. They're only going to read you Miranda if they want you to confess on something that they use after they've read you Miranda rights. Hmm. It's a very common misconception. I've ever actually seen someone, I remember in my possibly first day as an attorney uh, in Denton Court, Mm -hmm. that there was a uh, young man who said, Your Honor, they didn't read me my rights. And the judge said, That's a very common thing. I hear that all the time. And they don't have to. So, no, I'm not dismissing the case because they didn't read you Miranda rights. Huh. That's that's good to know. Yep. So, a lot of stuff doesn't happen like you see it on TV. Yeah. And that's a Supreme Court of the United States decision. So, that's the law of the land everywhere. Hmm. Maybe there are some states that it doesn't apply to, but it's the law here. The other thing that people commonly mistake is that the police have to tell you the truth. They don't. Mm -hmm. They are specifically allowed by the Supreme Court of the United States to lie to you about anything at any time. You can't lie to them, but they can lie to you. So that thing that says, if you are a cop, you have to tell me, not a thing. Mm. Not a thing at all. Wow. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what would you rank this? My cousin Vinny. Uh Uh-huh. I would give it an A. For a movie, I give it an A+. Mm Mm-hmm. As compared to what reality is, if you assume that you can get away with conning the judge and... Well, reality of how many people actually do the things that they did in this movie, I'd probably say a C. Because... There are lawyers. There are there pieces are, in there I could see There happening. are non-lawyers. The, the problem that I have with it the most is the unauthorized practice of law and how it wasn't detected. Mm-hmm. However... As somebody who, for a short time, I was on the committee for the unauthorized practice of law, and there were people that would go in and say, I'm a lawyer, and practice in open court. The judges on any particular court don't actually confirm the law license or any of that. Now, him having to get in pro hoc vice, that's a whole different level of con, because that's a form that you have to fill out and put all your license number Mm -hmm. and information and all that. And so if you're going to fraud those documents... Maybe you can get there. So maybe he gets past that. The actual lawyer. Oh, he has someone at yeah. the law school or something fax something yeah. in. Yeah, I remember that. A judge's secretary yes. did it or something. <laughs> yeah, he, he basically committed major fraud and it's not going to get detected and he gets away with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I wonder at the end of the movie, doesn't he, doesn't the judge find out, but since he won and did a good job, he lets it fly, he lets it slide. 
Yes, yeah, something. there Before he leaves, he says, I spoke to... No, no, they confirm. No, no, the person confirms to the judge. So judge thinks judge because he's trying to get out of there before the judge yeah, realizes. Yeah, and the judge judge thinks that he doesn't have a license the whole time. He's like trying to figure it out. Yeah, the whole time. And but Marissa Tomei, when she was on the payphone, yeah, and he's trying to get her to come in the courtroom and she yeah. won't. And he thinks she's pissed off at him and she's throwing a temper tantrum. And he's uh-huh. like, I need you now. And she's like, stop it. I'm on the phone. Like, she's like, that whole conversation right there is her getting somebody to fax something over. Oh, no. Okay. To help him out. Because, so assuming that he could actually pull off that fraud. Yeah. And get away with it and no one would Ever catch know? it. <laughs> then... I probably still give it an A plus because he pulled it off, mm-hmm. and a lot of what you saw was very, very accurate. There mm-hmm. was a lot of things you didn't see, but his cross examination of the the three witnesses mm-hmm. were excellent. Oh, he did a fantastic job on the third one. Remember, she's the lady that had the really thick glasses. Yes, and he takes the uh, tape measure across the courtroom. Yes, and it's only half the Brilliant. amount. I will tell you this. Yeah. That's not accurate. You know why? They do not allow you to have tape measures, at least in the Dallas County Court. Oh, wow. I tried to bring in a tape measure to do that exact thing in a case, and, and I they couldn't bring it in. It? No. That's crazy. So I had to pace it off to do the, the demonstration. Why wouldn't they let you bring in a tape measure? Did they think it was a weapon? Apparently, yeah, because huh? it's got a sharp edge. You can, yeah. you can apparently Cut I don't know, you can, or strangle them with it, something. Oh, wow. But yeah, so you can't bring in what tape measures in the Dallas one? Court. County Courthouse. What? What about a cloth one? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe yeah. I could have. If yeah. I would have just had one rolled up. Yeah. Like a, a paper one like you get at yeah. Ikea. Yeah. Could have or done even that. or even the ones you get for like clothing and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know the I could have maybe done a piece of yarn that was measured out. Yeah. But you would have had to prove the measurement of that yarn. Yeah, but you could probably say, so this is about a foot, right? And then I go, and then one Two, three, yeah. four, five, six. So but this visual, is about twenty feet, right? The visual aid is really helpful. Oh yeah. Oh, I I recently brought one in on a closing argument. I brought in a tube of neosporin mm-hmm. in front of a jury because that was the solution to a child that had a little bit of scratch on the face from a dog. Yeah. Uh, and the other side was acting like it, the child was almost killed, <laughs> which was not true. So. We have another case like that. So (laughs) if you can get past the unauthorized practice of Mm -hmm. law, I would, for a movie, I would give it an A plus. In reality, um, I mean, assuming all those are true and he won the case and it happened like that and how realistic is it? I mean, decently enough realistic for portraying something on in a movie. So Mm -hmm. I'd give it an A plus. Mm -hmm. Let's see what. Devin Stone gives it. Hey, that was my cousin Vinny. Now it's time to give the movie a grade for legal realism. I have a soft spot in my heart for this movie. It's so good. Everyone should absolutely see it. If you've never seen it before, I hope I didn't ruin it. First of all, you have Joe Pesci giving a masterful cross-examination and a masterful direct examination that, frankly, you could take those clips and use them to teach trial advocacy in law. And a lot of people do. Yep. School. You have some motion uh, practice and some civil procedure that is not 100% accurate, but pretty close. Of course, as a comedy, they take license with a few things. Joe Pesci is floundering around, making huge mistakes, but it sort of fits the narrative because he he's supposed suits. to be a really <laughs> terrible attorney. PremierClothiers.com. Yep. Who just got out of law school at the beginning of this movie. And there's some shenanigans with experts being allowed when they shouldn't be and lying to the judge, but it's done in such a way that it has a grain of truth to it. So it's hard for me to get over just how good this movie is because it's a fantastic comedy, it's a good drama, and it's a nice work of legal fiction. So I don't see how I can give My Cousin Vinny anything less than an A. It's so good. Go watch this movie. The defense rests. Vincent Gambini really screwed up by not wearing a proper suit to court. It's hard to overstate the value of a great suit. <laughs> so, yeah, go to premierclothiers.com, yep. and the uh, link is also in the description below. This is The Lawyer Dana Show. Bye. Cool.